Hey everybody, welcome back to the show, and boy howdy, is this an exciting one. You know why? Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why? I'll tell you why, but do you want to know why? Okay. It's a Robin chapter! Yeah! <laughs> oh my god, and it's a good one too. Oh my god, like some serious lore drops here. Insane, but also Robin chapter. Great, fantastic. You know what? Luffy had an entire arc where he fought against a Yonko and punched out a giant dragon with a huge monkey god fist, okay? Luffy can take a back seat for this arc. If you just want to focus all about on Robin here, in fact, like, if you just want to make her the main character of One Piece, which arguably, considering how she is involved with the Void Century and like the huge mysteries of the world, you could argue that she already is kind of the main character in the stuff that actually matters. Uh, Luffy's just out to, you know, have a fun time and, and get the One Piece. It's like, okay, all right then, well, let's focus on Robin from now until Laugh Tale, and then they find the One Piece, and Luffy's like, yay, I'm the Pirate King. I'm like, fantastic, okay. <laughs> but, you know, Robin's the one, all right, now you got your One Piece, now let's learn about these interesting you know, Rio Poneglyphs in the history of the world and all that kind of jazz, all right? Anyway, this is One Piece chapter 1066 titled The Will of Ohara. Ohara is the island in the West Blue, the place that Robin grew up with the scholars that was Buster called back in the Ennies Lobby arc. Okay, are we all on the same page here? Okay, good. So, uh, we continue on with the Germa's cover story, though. The Germa Double Sixes, emotionless excursion. Except their excursion has finally come to an end because they are returning home. And so in this chapter, we see the Germa Kingdom, which is not really a real kingdom with actual land. It's like a mobile kingdom, sort of like a Power Rangers mechanical set. You know, the big Megazords that you could get for like 80 bucks at Walmart way back in the late 90s. Those were always really fun. I love the Zenith Carrier Zord from uh, Lost Galaxy. That thing was awesome. I still have it around here somewhere. Anyway, so, um, yeah, it's a bunch of like snails, like sea snails that, you know, can actually sail in salt water that are towing this kingdom. And you see in the distance in the sky, you see all of the Germa siblings returning home. Ichiji, Niji, Yonji, and Reiju, as well as their new companion. Caesar Clown, who I'm sure is going to be able to... Actually, I can see Caesar kind of getting along with Judge here. So, you know, Judge is all about, like, evil science, and Caesar is, like, also about mad science. So you take evil science and mad science together. Like, Germa, like, Judge really has no compunctions about literally calling his kingdom a kingdom of evil. Like, the Germa kingdom is one of evil. So I think Caesar and Judge will probably get along fine. I also love that uh, we see the snails carrying the kingdom, and most of them just kind of look apathetic, just like, you know, it's like the animals in the Flintstones that were just like, you know, just what it is, it's a living, you know, whatever. But there's one snail, it's the, hold on, it's the fourth one over in the front of the ship of the Germa that just looks extraordinarily peeved off. This one snail is just like... Ugh, why are we even working for these guys just carrying their ships around every day? You know what? If I was the one in charge of the German kingdom and then all the other snails around him are just like, Oh God, you know, Dave is going on and on about his, you know, it's like his, he's going off on a rant again. It's like, you watch guys, you watch. I'm out of here someday. I'm just going to detach from the Germa and make my own adventure. He's like, okay, Dave, that's fantastic. Just keep pulling the ship, okay? We're all here. We're all working. Let's just deal with it, all right? So, um... We continue where we left off from the last chapter. We are in the Labosphere. We're in Vegapunk's laboratory. Uh, we also see, by the way, an overview of kind of both of the stratums, you know, the lower stratum, the fabrication stratum, and then the, the uh, what was the other one? I can't remember, because they all have different names and translations, but one's like, you know, the Labosphere up here, and then the fabrication one down here. Um, we saw this before, but I forgot to mention it. There's a building uh, down below in the fabrication stratum where Luffy and Bonnie's group was that resembles like a giant soda bottle or like a wine bottle and it's actually out of that wine bottle building that clouds emerge that go up into the labosphere that actually generates the island cloud okay so there's actually like a building that manufactures the cloud on the bottom and it creates the island cloud above using the pyrobrine so i just want to bring that up because it's like a nice little touch on where exactly the generator for these clouds is okay 
So, last chapter we had Shaka, Vegapunk number one, Vegapunk the good, who steps out and was like, hey, so what would, uh, what would you do if I told you that this island is not actually an island of the future, but it's actually based off of a civilization that lived over 900 years ago in the distant past? Uh, Shaka states, now... This is just conjecture here, and I think this is going to be his, uh, his, uh, uh, catchphrase, so to speak, because he says this a lot in the chapter. He'll drop, like, a bunch of crazy lore, and at the very end of it, he'll be like, now this is just conjecture, which can mean one of two things. It could just be, like, a funny little quirky thing that Oda incorporated into Shaka's character. Like, that's just his thing that he says at the end of every sentence. He's like, you know what? I think the One Piece could actually be a bottle of sake. Now this is just conjecture. You know what else I think? I think the entire world might have been separated by the Red Line, and the One Piece is some mechanism to bring down the entire Red Line and make the whole ocean one piece. Now this is just conjecture though, you know? It could be just like that just for fun, or it could be like, some of the stuff he says here might actually just be conjecture. It might not actually be the truth, okay? He's gonna drop some hot lore bombs on us in this chapter. Some of it might turn out to be true. Maybe all of it might turn out to be true, but we'll see how that goes, all right? So, uh, he starts talking about an certain kingdom, all right? Which, of course, is the ancient kingdom or the great kingdom, depending on the translation, that Professor Clover spoke about during Ohara. You know, he was talking about, he was researching this kingdom for many years. Cypher Pull showed up and, uh, you know, put him on a Den Den Mushi call with the Gorosei, the leaders of the world, as far as he's concerned, right? And so, at that point, Clover felt like, I, I think he kind of felt like he was going to die that day anyway. He probably didn't know that the entire island was going to get Buster called, but he knew he was probably going to die. So he was just like, you know what, if I'm here having an audience with the Gorosei, I might as well, you know, bring it up. So he brings it up and he's just like, you know, I know all about the ancient kingdom, you know, their technology, the kind of stuff that they could do. And their name was, and before he could even say the name to the government officials and the Cypherpole 9, remember back then it was run by Spawn Dean, who was Spondum's father back then. Uh, also, Khalifa's dad was uh, Lashki. He was also part of CP9 back in the day during the Ohara mission, okay? But before anybody could hear the name of it, the Gorosei interrupt Clover, and they're like, SHOOT HIM NOW! And then Spondine shoots him now, and then he dies, and that's how Clover died right there, okay? Robin, uh, she says, like, okay, wait a second, hold on. And by the way, keep in mind, all the Straw Hats are still fused to the floor, uh, with the Dom shoes, the Dominatrix shoes that now exist. So, um, none of them can actually move. They're just like, imagine your feet are just glued to the floor. So you're having this really epic kind of conversation, learning about the history of the Void Century a little bit, learning about the uh, the Ancient Kingdom. Robin's finding out stuff about um, the person that taught her about archaeology, you know, stuff she never knew about Clover. And the entire time, they can't actually move their feet at all. So anyway, um, she's like, okay, wait a second, Dr. Vegapunk. Are you saying that the Ancient Kingdom was, you know, and, and all this technology and machinery and stuff like that was created during the Void Century? Like, the Void Century had robots and all the kind of crazy stuff you have on Egghead. And, uh, Vegapunk, he just kind of turns and he's like, I don't know, you tell me. So, just, like, can we just, okay, God, come on, let's just get going. It's just like, I don't know, this is just conjecture. I don't know, you tell me. I had a... Back in community college, I had this professor who always did that shit, and nobody was a fan of him because you'd ask him a question. He was a philosophy professor, in case you didn't know, and uh, he taught like philosophy and like world religions and that kind of stuff, right? And uh, every time we would ask him a question, even if it was like just a clarifying question, you know, like what does this mean or what does this passage mean or what about this or how about this relation to this, he would always just look at you and just be like, I don't know, what do you think? I don't know, what do you think about it? I understand the kind of like Socratic method of just like getting you to answer the questions, but it was like all the all the time so it was like ah just answer the question all right it wasn't even that complicated it was just a clarifying question for god's sake it wasn't even that much of a philosophical deep conversation you know anyway so uh we we um keep in mind like 
Robin has probably told of uh, the Straw Hats a little bit about her past. You know, we don't really get a lot of moments with the Straw Hats all sitting around on the sunny talking about their backstories at length with each other, okay? We don't have moments where, you know, Chopper sits down and is just like, all right, everybody, let me tell you the story about Dr. Hero, look, my father. You know, because, like, Luffy and the others would know about him, but, like, when Frankie and Brooke joined up, they would have no idea. So, I'm sure Robin has talked a little bit about her past with the other Straw Hats, but for the most part, we have Nami, Usopp, Frankie, and Sanji here that are just kind of in the background, just like listening to this crazy ass story about ancient kingdoms and void centuries. And they're just like, whoa, this is deep, guys. <laughs> you know? Um, oh, man. And also, keep in mind, uh, bear with me a little bit. There's a lot more text in this chapter than usual, okay? And in fact, because of that, I actually already missed something. Okay. So, uh, Vegapunk goes on to say, by the way, the reason that he has an understanding of, like, why the Void Century had the same machinery as he does now is he mentions at a certain archaeological site... Probably this was not Ohara or Egghead. This was probably just some other site at some other place in the world. He mentions, I mean, I guess it could have been Ohara, but I doubt it. He mentions that they found archaeological evidence of, like, machinery, of, like, the robots. It was probably the robot that was in the junk heap that Luffy and Bonnie's group saw last chapter, okay? So, like, out there in the world, like I said, if there was some massive war between the ancient kingdom and the world government, or the 20 kingdoms that would become the world government back in the day, and they had robots and stuff, like a giant Machina army, like, ancient robot army, marching all over the world, massive battles taking place, um, there would be archaeological evidence of that. Now, of course, the government would try to scrub everything and they would probably be very successful but you know let's say there was a robot that got destroyed in a battle 900 years ago fell into like one of the deepest parts of the ocean landed on the ocean floor and it got covered up with algae and moss and dirt for the last nine centuries you know what I mean government you know it doesn't know it's there they can't hide it so Vegapunk might have found you know that robot there under the ocean or maybe on some random deserted island under a mountain of rubble or, or something like that okay but there you can't completely eliminate history you're gonna find evidence of it somewhere, okay? And so Vegapunk goes on to say, he, he basically talks about everything that we kind of knew so far as the fan base. Um, but the thing is, like, not all the Straw Hats would know about this. And you also have to assume, even the stuff that we learned about, like, we read during Ohara, that doesn't mean that, like, even Robin knows that, okay? Like, for example, that moment when Clover was about to speak the name of the Ancient Kingdom, and then Spondine shot him at the behest of the Gorosei, I don't think Robin was there for that, so she wouldn't have known that, like, Ancient Kingdom? Name? What's the name of that? She wasn't there, at least, I don't think, during that moment. I think she left at that point, so, you know what I mean? Like, she would not even be aware of that. So anyway... Vega, Vegapunk kind of brings everybody up to speed. He's just like, now this is just conjecture. But what I believe is that there was a conflict during the Void Century. That conflict involved the Ancient Kingdom, which I've been speaking about with the high advanced technology, and the 20 kingdoms that would eventually become the world government. Obviously, those 20 kingdoms won, and the world government was formed. And that organization, the world government, has essentially rewritten and shaped history ever since. And they've gone through expressive, um, you know, detail and, what's a word, what's, what's a good word here, and diligence to remove every aspect of that history of that conflict from the history books, okay? And obviously the government spreads a lot of propaganda. Most places that are allied with the world government, like if you're going to school in a nation that's allied with the world government, they're going to be teaching you a completely different kind of history. I would imagine the history they would teach would be mostly along the lines of like everything before the world government was like just, a, 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 you know, destitute. It was horrible. There were like crazy warring factions everywhere. The world was in action absolute upheaval. And then, of course, the world government came in, the 20 kingdoms, allied the whole world, you know, set up the empty throne. Oh, isn't it so glorious? Not a single person shall rule the world. All that horrible strife is now over, and everything will be ice cream, puppies and kittens, and rainbows for the rest of time. Probably something like that in, like, the world government issued history book. We see Nami, Usopp, Frankie, and Sanji's reaction to that. Uh, Nami and Usopp's are pretty much just, like, shock and awe, you know? She's like, oh my god! 
God. And Usopp's like, that's crazy. Frankie is excited. He's like, wow, that's such a super romantic tale. Not romance in the sense of like romance, like romantic romance, but also like romance like romance dawn. I said romance like 10 times in the last sentence. Oda really loves that term, romance dawn. That was like the previous like chapter ones, like the preliminary prototype versions of One Piece before it actually happened. Romance Dawn version one, Romance Dawn version two, and then the chapter one of One Piece is still Romance Dawn. So romance or romantic in the sense of like an adventure, a grand story, that kind of romance, okay? Sanji's reaction though I love because he's the one that I think figures out like, wait a second, holy crap, we're... I mean, we're learning about stuff that the world government doesn't teach you in school. We're learning about stuff that the world government would... Wait a second, if we learn this information, we're probably... The world government would probably want us to be... And then Shaka just finishes his sentence like, Oh, eliminated? Oh, yeah. Anybody that learns this information is probably going to be immediately on the government's hit list. And then everyone like Usopp is everyone's like, Okay, well then shut up! La 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 la! I'm not listening! You know, just like, I don't want to hear anymore! You know what I mean? So Shaka just straight up says like, Yeah, yeah, the fact that uh, we're in the same boat now! And just like, oh, damn it! I mean, they're pirates anyway, so the world government's not going to like them anyway. But the fact that they have this information, Shaka is just going on to say, like, if anybody, you know, has this knowledge or even, you know, uh, you know, thinks about these ideas, even as a theory, you know, as just, um, you know, a guess or a hypothesis or something like that, um, yeah, the world government's not going to like you very much. And then even Usopp, you know, it's great because he provides the comic relief in this chapter. Uh, he can't move, so instead he, like, bends his legs all the way back and starts bashing his head against the floor. Like, okay, brain, you can forget what you just heard now. Ancient kingdom, great war, I don't know, man. Ugh, he just keeps bashing his brain against the floor. So, one thing that I do like, a little nice touch in this chapter... Robin is not very keen on just revealing her whole backstory to Vegapunk here. Um, you know, she's not just going to be like, oh, O'Hara, well, let me tell you everything about O'Hara. Let me tell you everything about Clover, everything they were researching, everything. Because Robin is a little bit reticent to do that because, well, Vegapunk works for the government, all right? So she's like, maybe this might be a ploy to just, you know, get me to reveal some information about the uh, archaeologists and O'Hara, and they were like the closest thing I had to family next to the Straw Hats, of course, and um, yeah, Robin's not going to immediately jump at that, okay? And also, for the most of her life, she spent running from the world government because of that very information, so she's not just going to start explaining all this to everybody, okay? So, uh, Shaka looks over at Robin, though, and is just like, oh, so what do you think? You know, just the fact the world government exists right now and is covering things up, shouldn't that prove the theory of the ancient kingdom and the war and the conflict and everything, what do you think, Nico Robin? And Robin looks at Shaka and she, her reaction is also very intelligent. She's like, I don't know why you're asking me. Yeah, the scholars of O'Hara, they, they did have a theory about the stuff you're talking about. They had lots of theories about the Void Century. It was like a big part of their studies. Um, but you're a high up in the world government. You're like really up there, okay? So any information that the O'Harans had, you had, you have to have too. So why are you asking me? And this is a very important, this might be actually one of the more important lore drops in the chapter, so bear with this. Uh, Vegapunk says, government affiliation means nothing. It does not matter how high up you are, unless like obviously you're like the Gorosei or even higher than that, I don't know. Um, he says like government affiliation means nothing. What I do for the government means nothing. Um, you know, if they found out I knew about this stuff or I was talking about this or I was researching this, uh, it would result in my immediate erasure. Okay, which is something he even talked about to Dragon a few chapters ago. Like, I think I'm going to die soon, probably because of that. And it's true. They are sending Cypher Pool Zero to Egghead right now to eliminate Vegapunk. Okay, now that's important because that clears up a lot of things where, where does Vegapunk stand on this? We knew Vegapunk was high up in the government, but how high up? Okay, does he know about Eam? Most likely not. Eam is probably kept under, like, only the Gorosei and his private, like, servants, because he did have, like, private servants, and those are the only people that know about Eam's existence, okay? Um, you know, Sakazuki as the fleet admiral does not know about Eam, probably. Kong as the commander-in-chief does not know about Eam, probably. I would argue most of the Tenrubito and the Cypher Pool don't even know about Eam, you know what I mean? So it's that kind of stuff they're really keeping locked down. I mean, there are levels here. There are certainly levels. Vegapunk is privy to a lot 
lot of information when it comes to stuff re revolving around the Navy, of course, and maybe the world government and a general, you know, tone of things, but they're not sharing everything with him. They're not bringing him into, like, the Gorosei aren't sitting down with Vegapunk every Sunday to talk about their plan to take over the world, you know what I mean? And so there's, like, even though I'm providing all this really important technology and machinery for the world government, and they give me the funding and everything like that, and I'm helping them, you know, try to conquer the world, um, you know, I I'm still expendable. I'm just as expendable as, like, a random Marine or a random government soldier that decides to go rogue. You know, if a random member of Cypher Pole Zero decides to, li not, not Cypher Pole Zero, but if a random member of, like, Cypher Pole 5 decided to, you know, leave, they would just exterminate him without a question. I'm kind of in the same vein there. Um, and so Usopp keeps going on. He's like, well, then quit telling us all this important stuff here. This is torture. At least let us walk out. You know, it's like Usopp is like, hey, listen, um, you guys can have this conversation. Can I just, can you let me go down the hall? I'll have a soda and just chill out by the water cooler or something. You don't need me here for this. I'm just a guy from the East Blue, from a humble little village. I fire a slingshot. Uh, I, I don't need to be part of these grand, you know, void century conversations, right? Um, and so Robin, though, as a response to that, brings up something very important, uh, because, you know, Vegapunk said, you know, I'm not privy to the information, you know, the, the government did not tell me about what they found at O'Hara, so Robin is like, well, then how do you know? How did you find out about this stuff? So it's almost like Robin is claiming that maybe Vegapunk is lying or not being truthful with her, because she says all the books and all of the research, everything that was O'Hara was destroyed. It was burned to the ground in the Buster Call. And so Vegapunk brings up... The will of O'Hara lives on. Title drop! There we go. And so, now we cut back to uh, a flashback. We get a lot of flashbacks in this chapter. Uh, this first one's more of just, like, um, Shaka or Vegapunk reminiscing about it. Oh, and by the way, also, he's reminiscing about the actual main body of Vegapunk arriving on the island 22 years ago, a few months after the O'Hara incident, okay? So, once again, proving that, you know, all of the Vegapunks share the mind and memories of the original, okay? So, even though this is Shaka, who didn't come into existence until probably much later, he still remembers everything that the original Vegapunk experienced like it was his own life, okay? So that's important to mention there. Um, Shaka mentions, he's like, you know, okay, the will of O'Hara lives on, and the news of that day, I mean, it shocked the world, you know? Like, you know, O'Hara was supposed to be, like, the haven for all the archaeologists and the scholars in the world, and then overnight it was annihilated by the government, and the government's only excuse there was, like, oh, yes, it was the devils of O'Hara. They were getting together to try to, like, overthrow the government with their evil science and history knowledge, you know what I mean? And so, at this point, Robin begins to tear up. Like, progressively throughout this chapter, Robin, you know, cries a lot more. She begins to get, like, angry, and then a little weepy, and then a lot weepy, and then she's crying at the end because she finds out something, so it's more of tears of joy at the end, uh, or relief. And so Robin goes through a lot of an emotional range in this chapter. I can't wait until this is in the anime, but I think Oda did a fantastic job with depicting Robin's, like, emotional state here, because it is a roller coaster. Because literally, Robin is literally pinned to the floor, and she's kind of, like, forced to have this conversation, okay? Even though it's like talking about like the worst day of her life objectively, um, she can't just walk away from it or avoid the conversation anymore. She has to talk about this right now. Like this is really important stuff for what's going to happen later. Like we're in the end game now. The world government's on the move. The Marines are on the move. Cypher pull zero, sword, everything. Pirates are on the move. Yonko are defeated. Luffy's a Yonko now. Like, like this is happening. This has to happen, the conversation, okay? Um, so, he talks a little bit about Clover, and we learn a little bit more about Clover's past. Uh, you know, Shaka says that Clover was my good friend, and that he was always an adventurer. He would always be traveling the world with his archaeological team, trying to learn as much as he could about the Void Century in the Ancient Kingdom. Like, he was, like, you know, supremely focused on that. That was his, like, what his, like, doctorate dissertation would be on, or whatever. The Ancient Kingdom, right? He mentions we get to see Clover in his younger years, because he was a pretty old guy, by the, I think he was in his 80s by the time he died. So 
we see him in his younger years traveling on a ship that had Clover written on it. So I would imagine Clover back in his younger years, uh, it was sort of a situation like with Pedro. When Pedro left Zoe to go research the Poneglyphs, he was not a pirate crew. He did not want to have a pirate crew. They were the Knox Expeditionary Party. But because researching Poneglyphs was against the government law, they were branded as pirates, and so they just became the Knox Pirate Crew, okay? Probably something very similar with Clover, where Clover just went out to sea to just learn and study about archaeology. Just He just wanted to dig stuff out of the ground and just, oh, yes, interesting. This piece of robotic technology had to originate during the Void Century, and the government's like, that's a big no-no. So it's probably just like, you know, the O'Hara Expeditionary Party, and then it got probably rebranded into like the O'Hara Pirates or the Clover Pirates or something like that. But we see him in his younger years. He's got his head, which is like a clover. We see him with a sword. He might have been able to fight well back in the day. Vegapunk brings up that he was incarcerated about 10 times by the world government. 10 times, but I guess managed to, I guess, sneak away every time. Because that's the thing. It's like, if you're researching the ancient kingdom and the government arrests you, you'd think they would just take you into a dark room under Marijois and you would never see the light of day again, okay? But the fact he was incarcerated 10 times, I mean, maybe he was captured by the Marines and thrown in a ship and like he was like taken away to be judged or executed or whatever and he managed to escape like every single time okay so it might have been something like that um but yeah he was definitely caught a bunch of times by the government and he managed to get away and he set up his uh, base of operations on O'Hara for many years and he became the chief sci not scientist chief archaeologist chief scholar chief professor whatever you want to call it there okay because O'Hara was essentially like a giant university if you really want to think about it in that regard just a place where everybody could come together it's sort of like how Egghead is with like, you know, sciences like biology and, you know, geology and uh, stuff like that. Uh, O'Hara was more about like, you know, history and the arts kind of stuff, that kind of thing, right? Um, let's see here. Uh, we see an image of Vegapunk arriving at O'Hara a few months after the Buster Calls, so it's completely burned out at this point. Uh, I was always under the impression the government, whenever they Buster Call an island, they would set up, like, you know, a military blockade kind of thing around it. Maybe not, okay, this is a few months after O'Hara. This isn't, like, the next day, alright? So this is several months later. The government at this point probably just thought they burned everything to the ground, there's nothing there. There was probably a sign somewhere, like, you know, off-limits, government property, no trespassing, world government, you know, you'll be executed to the fullest extent of the law, which means you'll be executed. You know, they probably have signs and rope around the perimeter of the island, but, you know, they're not going to keep a guard on standby every hour of every day, making sure no one shows up to a burnt-out wasteland, all right? Maybe they did in the initial first few weeks after the attack, but after a while, you know, they have pirates to fight. They can't be like, okay, your job is to protect a burned-out wasteland to make sure no one goes there. And I mean, and they don't have like modern military like radar or anything like that. So it's like, it's just there. Okay. So we see Vegapunk arriving. We see the silhouette of his body and it's it's quite unusual. Uh, you guys know about Strawberry, right? The Marine Vice Admiral right now that has the giant head. Well, Vegapunk puts Strawberry to shame, okay? Uh, Strawberry's head is, it's pretty big. I mean, it's probably like, its I think it's taller than his own body, you know? But uh, Vegapunk's is like... Okay, imagine a character like Kaido or Big Mom, but like 80% of their, no. 90% of their body was just forehead. There you go. <laughs> All right, that's about right. So anyway, we see a couple months after the Abuster call, uh, you know, Vegapunk, the actual Stella body of Vegapunk, arrives on O'Hara wearing a black suit, like a morning suit, where, you know, having a, a bouquet of flowers because Clover was his friend, and also, like, these were just people that wanted to learn about history of the world, and history is everything, and, uh, you know, uh, geography is everything, of course, and so he just wanted to just honor their memory. So he shows up, and he mentions that I saw something extraordinary. I saw a lake on the island at the base of the Tree of Knowledge. They burned even the Tree of Knowledge to the ground. And the Tree of Knowledge, he was really heartbroken by that. He's like, I, I knew the government was going to eliminate this island, but I didn't think they would go that far to, like, burn down and destroy the Tree of Knowledge. Which, fun fact, the Tree of Knowledge 
is the oldest thing in One Piece that we know of. Um, I think it was the furthest dated back thing, like like a date we got. I think it's like, uh, oh man, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. I think it's five thousand years old. Okay, it might be a little older, but I'm I'm thinking five thousand years old right now. And of course, that's several millennia older than even the Void Century. Okay, so it kind of gives us an idea that there's more stuff to this than just the Void Century. The Void Century might just be the beginning, and everything before that has been rewritten by the government, which needs to be rediscovered, okay? So it might be a thing like, Robin might learn about the Void Century, at, you know, uh, with the Rio Poneglyph at the end of this story, and then spends the rest of her life learning about the, the beyond that. You know, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, trying to recover all the history that the government destroyed. Alright, so we'll, we'll see where that goes. But anyway, remember, back at O'Hara, when it was going, when it was burning down, the uh, scholars grabbed as many books as they could out of the Tree of Knowledge, which is essentially a giant library, and they were throwing it into this lake. Because if it was a choice between having the book burned up, it would be gone forever. Yeah, water damage is a problem, but hey, at least it might be still salvageable, okay? Especially, like, if the paper is good quality, maybe if the ink is all right. I mean, honestly speaking, I remember our old house flooded, and I had a bunch of books in the basement that were just completely destroyed. But who knows? Maybe O'Hara paper, O'Hara ink is, like, way better quality, you know? So they're just throwing these books into this giant lake to avoid the fire. Now, I was aware of that, but also there was a scene where government employees saw the lake, like they were there. They didn't just burn the island down and leave. They burned the island down, and then they walked around the island to do a perimeter check to make sure there was no survivors, because that's kind of the whole point. And a few government employees saw this massive lake filled with books, okay? And it's a lot of books, like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even over a million books are in this lake, okay? So the government employees see this, and they're just like, Hey, what's this over here? Wow, it looks like a bunch of books in that lake! Man, they must have given their lives, their last few fleeting moments, to throw books into a lake. Think we should report this to HQ? Nah, they're just a bunch of stupid books. Yeah, let's get out of here. Shaka gives an explanation for this. He says, If any Marines did discover the books, they were apparently too ignorant to understand their value and left them be. Okay, I'm calling bullshit on that. I'm sorry. Like, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, then those Marines, the, not the Marines, those government employees that saw that book, they need to be fired immediately, okay? Because think about this, all right? The whole reason the Gorosei ordered a buster call, or Spondeen ordered the buster call, was to wipe out the island because they know too much. Literally, the one thing they don't want the world to know about is the name of the ancient kingdom and the whole story of that conflict. Clover knew about that, all right? So Clover even admitted to the Gorosei, I know the name of the ancient kingdom, and then immediately he got shot. You would think the Gorosei would want to scrub everything from that island, like burn the island down, buster call it, and they did. And then they're doing, like, a perimeter sweep to, like, make sure no one survived. And they find a lake filled with literally over a million books of all of the collected knowledge of O'Hara. That means that those, those dipshits in the world government didn't even, like, report that back to HQ. Or if they did, HQ was just like, yeah, a bunch of books in a lake. Yeah, they can't do anything anymore. That doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. Like, somebody had to drop the ball here because there's no way that information made it back to the Gorosei. Because you, if, it, if it did, the Gorosei, do you think like, the Gorosei would just be sitting there like, wait a second, a bunch of books in a lake? Hmm. Well, I guess it's possible that Clover could have, I don't know, written down his research. He was the one that said, you know, just like, the world government, you guys, I know the history of the ancient kingdom. And then they shoot him, and it's like, yeah, he probably didn't write that down anywhere. He probably didn't write the name of the ancient kingdom and all he learned in a book somewhere, right? No, the Goro say, they, they, they should have issued an order to, like, every book destroy. Destroy everything on that island. That would make sense. You find a scroll, a book, a leaflet, you burn it. You destroy it immediately. That should have been the order, and I feel like it was the order, 
And then you find a mountain of books, and they're like, yeah, nah. Then they're like, yeah, that's probably water damaged. You know, I'm tired, man. I want to go get dinner. Let's get out of here. You know, like that, oh, that, that does bother me. That does bother me. And even if... Like, that doesn't make any sense. The Goros say would even if they would want those books, right? They'd be like, oh, you found a mountain of books that the, the scholars saved? Bring them back to Marijua. We need them, all right? This is like six months later. This is like the Buster Call has happened at this point. The island's just there, abandoned. And they're just sitting there in the lake. <laughs> just like no one felt to check. <laughs> Dad, I, 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 I'm guessing, okay. The, oh, I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna assume that uh, the Gorosei never knew about that. All right, I'm gonna assume the Gorosei never knew about that. I'm gonna assume that that was on the uh, the cipher pole, or not even maybe the cipher pole at that point. That might have just been like whoever was in charge of the cleanup operation. So maybe just like regular government soldiers. They're not cipher pole, they just wear the suits and walk around with guns all the time. They might have seen it and they might have just been like, do you really want to go down there and dig out all those books out of the lake? Because you know if we report it back to HQ, they're going to want us to go do that. We're going to have to be the ones that go into the water over the next few weeks and dig out all these damn soggy books. Like, yeah. Hey, how about we just, how about we just don't tell them? I'm like, yeah, who cares? You know, the island's already burned down. What else are a bunch of stupid books going to do? I like to think that's what happened. Those, like, low-level employees dropped the ball, and it never made it to the higher-ups, okay? That's the only way this makes sense, all right? Okay. Even so, it's a little weird, because in a government operation, you would report on everything, right? Like, you wouldn't just, like, skip over something like that. You would report on every single thing of anomaly that you find, but whatever. Anyway, I mean, yeah, just maybe, maybe human laziness. What are you gonna do? Uh, at that moment, Vegapunk says, as soon as I discovered that lake of books, I couldn't help but start to cry because I knew the will of Ohara lived on. All of their research, all of the information. You understand, there are probably books down there that are only the only copy in existence. Yeah, they might be water damaged, but it's better than nothing, right? So, at this point, Robin begins to cry it even more. She remembers her mother, Nico Olvia. She remembers Clover. She remembers Saul. She remembers all the people. Like, her two friends her entire life were Clover and Saul, and then she meets her mom, who left when she was like two, that she barely remembered, and then she died when Robin was like eight, in her arms, okay? And so we see that flashback right there, we see Nico Olvia just like, we just can't give up on your future, right? And so she's crying, and she, you know, she gets away there, of course, we see Kuzan, like, save her, well, Kuzan kind of provides the mechanism for her to escape the island with the ice and the rowboat, and he's just like, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, th th this is enough, I'll let you get away, all right? And so we see Saul there running away as well. Like, your, your mama's an honorable woman. Just remember that, Nico Robin. Remember that. You gotta laugh. You always gotta laugh. By the way, I gotta dust off my Saul voice because uh, we'll see in a second here. Okay, now Robin. Oh, man, she starts to cry. Oh, man, I feel so bad for her. But also you have Frankie in the background that's just like, how dare you make Robin cry? You know, it's like, let us go so we can beat the crap out of you or whatever there. Robin brings up the next logical question here. She says, okay, so what about the books from the lake? Where are they at right now? And uh, Vegapunk says, you know, I really wanted to take them back to Punk Hazard. This was back, we even see his boat back then had PH on it. So it was Punk Hazard back in the day. By the way, PH, Punk Hazard, PH levels. Is that, a, is that a pun that Oda was making about science because pH levels and then pH, punk hazard? I don't know. Anyway, he's like, I wanted to bring back all those books to punk hazard at the time, but he's like, well, if the government found out about it, if the government found I had an entire, you know, illegal library filled with O'Hara knowledge, they would probably eliminate me and punk hazard and all the books for good this time. However, instead, there were a bunch of giants there, just they happened to be there at the same time I was there, and these giants were fishing out a bunch of the books out of the lake in giant like fishing nets, okay? And so, Vegapunk was there watching them, and he's just like, what are those giants doing with that knowledge? I, I, cause he was like, he doesn't know, cause he's like, what are they doing? And they're taking it away? We can't allow them to do that. And at that point, we have Dragon there. So Dragon was also on Ohara. By the way, this was all coincidence from what we understand. Like, you know, a, a couple of months on some random day, uh, Vegapunk decided to visit Ohara at the same time Dragon just also happened to be visiting Ohara at the same time the giants also happened to be visiting 
visiting O'Hara. Like, th these three individuals, these three factions were completely, they didn't coordinate, they just ended up there at the same time. Anyway, we see Dragon there in his younger years. So this was 22 years ago, Dragon's 55 right now, so he was 33 back then, he lacked his facial tattoo. Um, this was two years after Roger's execution, we see him there as well. He was at Roger's execution, he had the hood, he didn't have his, his uh, tattoo yet, and he just looked very solemn and serious. I mean, Dragon always kind of looks solemn and serious, but he, there he looked particularly solemn and particularly serious. So, here he is, and he just kind of steps down, and he's just like, oh, Vegapunk, it's been a while. Yeah, don't worry about the Giants. I had a chat with them earlier. They're going to be taking those books back to Elbaf. Don't worry. Apparently, they were led by, uh, they were ordered by some giant that was covered in bandages. So, some kind of, like, mummy giant or something. Anyway, don't worry. They're not going to destroy the books or anything like that. They're not going to hand them over to the world government. So, uh, Vegapunk, by the way, we get a full view of him, finally, and his Stella body is... It's Albert Einstein's, you know, like the picture that Albert Einstein took with his tongue, like, mm, you know, like that's, that's the picture here, okay? So, Vegapunk, oh god, how to describe this man's body. By the way, most people that anything, whatever you guessed up until now, probably not accurate, although... You can go back and look this up, but I remember I was part of Roger Bass's uh, Vegapunk design contest like three or four years ago. I think it was back in 2018. He did the art contest, and everyone entered into what they thought Vegapunk would look like. If I remember correctly, the winner of that contest actually did draw Vegapunk with like a giant forehead. So it would make sense, okay? Because he has, get it? Because he has a big brain, so Oda takes that extraordinarily literally and has a giant head that reaches the stars, okay? So, Vegapunk's whole body, though, okay? Well, first of all, he's wearing a rather dapper suit. So, his legs are, like, this much of his body, and then his torso and head are, like, this much of his body, and then his head goes all the way up to here, okay? So, that gives you an idea. Very thin pencil legs, and then, like, a, like a kind of egg-shaped torso and head. Um, doesn't really look like he has much of a neck, which I imagine he wouldn't, because the, the weight of his head, his head has to weigh, like, at least, like, three, four hundred pounds. So it's just like, ugh. So he has no neck. Um, he has a mustache, and he has hair that's growing all the way up on the side of his head. So he has hair, but it's just the whole forehead is hair. His whole head is hair. And then he has a tongue, but he's not just sticking his tongue out. This is, like, Paro Sparrow levels of tongue, all right? So, like, and he also has a nice pair of shades, okay? So, that's Vegapunk, and he's uh, 43 years old here, so we finally get an age for Vegapunk. Um, yeah, so that's 22 years ago, so that means Vegapunk right now would be 65. Yeah, so I thought Vegapunk would be a lot older than that right now. I thought he would be like in his 90s or maybe even older, maybe like 200 years old with like cybernetic enhancements. But no, he's he's the same age. He's like a normal age right now. He's like 65. He's not even really that old, to be honest with you. There's plenty of characters like Darp is older than Vegapunk. Sengoku's older than Vegapunk. Um, you know, a lot of characters are actually. So anyway, we see him there and... Um, you know, he mentions, so, so apparently Dragon and Vegapunk had a, uh, an interaction before this, okay, where Dragon asked Vegapunk to join the Freedom Fighters. They're not the Revolutionary Army yet, they're just the Freedom Fighters, okay? And then Vegapunk said, it's like, ah, Dragon, I can't join your organization, you know what I mean? Like, you don't have the funding, you guys are too poor. He, like, he straight up says that. You guys are too poor, I, what's the use of my scientific knowledge if I don't have the funding and the resources and the tools necessary to actually build the stuff that's in my head. You know what I mean? And Vegapunk, I mean, a dragon even mentions to Vegapunk, hey, your head looks even bigger than the last time I saw it. You know what I mean? So implying it's very literal. Every time that Vegapunk's knowledge grows, his head gets bigger and bigger, to the point where it probably got so big he couldn't move, and so that's why he had to, uh, you know, split his intelligence into six different bodies. We're actually going to see Vegapunk in the current storyline at the end of this chapter, and he looks very different. So we'll see how that goes, or at least part of him looks very different. So uh, he, he put off a few pounds. Let's just say that. So, um, uh, after uh, Roger's execution, Dragon looked very serious and then he walked away. I like to think at that point, that was when Dragon decided to, you know, rebel against the world government. Now, back then, it was just a ragtag group. Um, it was not the organization of the Revolutionary Army that they have today, which is pretty organized, and they have different bases and officers and generals and locations all over the globe, and they're fighting the good fight. Back then, it was just a group of, like, 
you know, maybe half a dozen people. In fact, we learn the founding members of the Revolutionary Army in this chapter. I'll just say it now. Dragon, Kuma, and Ivankov. Those were the three founding members of the Revolutionary Army. It could have been Vegapunk, too, if he would have joined back then. So I like to think right after Roger's execution, you know, Dragon goes around the world. He gains his allies. He meets Kuma. He meets Ivankov. They get together. They start the Freedom Fighters, and they just start doing what they can do, right? And then eventually, over the years, over the next two decades, that builds and builds until the other generals join, and then the vice ca captains join, and then the whole, like, extended Revolutionary Army, and they set up their base on Baltico, and they have everybody working for them and all that kind of jazz. Has, right? So, uh, yeah, it's really interesting, though, because I love how Oda does this, where he'll take a big mystery like Vegapunk, like we've wondered about Vegapunk forever, and he'll focus on Vegapunk in a story arc while also simultaneously setting up a bunch of other layers for the next story arc. So we're probably not going to find out everything about Dragon in this arc. It's more about Vegapunk, but the fact is we're learning a little bit about Dragon, and then that will all come to a head later on in the story. All right, I love that type of shit where Oda doesn't just like okay in this arc We're gonna reveal this and that's it and then in this next arc We're gonna reveal this no It's like he sets up a bunch of stuff in the sidelines So this is finally time for dragon dragon story to be told okay, and this is great so um it seems like Dragon had a little bit of animosity to uh, Vegapunk. He's not exactly on a... He's not really happy with him right now because he asked him to join the Freedom Fighters. Vegapunk said no because they're too poor. And Dragon was sort of like... All right, fine, we, we would love to have you, but whatever. I guess that's that makes sense. But then Vegapunk went and joined the world government which Dragon really doesn't like that. He's just like, I can't believe that you, you know, you, you spurned my offer to join the Freedom Fighters, the good fight to try to save the common people of the world, to go and join, to become a government lapdog, basically. And so, Vegapunk actually brings up a very good point here. He's just like, ah, you're as blunt as ever. But, like, listen, Dragon, the world government is an insanely massive organization. There are plenty of decent people in the world government, especially in the Navy, in the Marines, that I have a lot of allies with, okay? And that is important to mention, and that, that might have actually changed Dragon's ideology. Back in the day, when Dragon first started the Freedom Fight, his goal might have been to just eliminate the world government, like the whole thing. Now they've stated, like, no, their goal is not to eliminate the world government, it's to eliminate the Tenru Bito, because that's the origin of the corruption. If they can eliminate the Tenru Bito system, but keep the infrastructure of the world government and the Marines, because that's not necessarily a bad thing if it's run correctly, okay? And you get the Tenru Bito out of there. So I like to think that maybe Dragon spent the next few days, like, his ideology evolved over the years. It wasn't the same as he is now. I get the impression here at this point, Dragon, you know, he's in his early 30s, and he's like, you know, there's a lot about his past we just don't know about. Maybe it involves Luffy's mom being a celestial dragon, who knows? But anyway, it's just like, man, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sock it to the world government. I've had enough of their crap! You know what I mean? And then he starts the Freedom Fighters, but then over the years, he gets maybe a little bit more wiser, and he's just like, okay, maybe we shouldn't just eliminate the entire world government. Maybe that might not work so well. That might actually cause more problems in the world. But, um, and they, they, they focus on the main problem, which is the Tenere Veto, okay? Dragon also mentions, you know, I can't, you know, it's like, whatever, I get it, but I, I can't sit back after this. I mean, this, this, the destruction of Ohara, Buster calling uh, Ohara, that's just too damn much. You see a little thing, I think it's a fragment or like a branch of the, um, uh, the tree of knowledge that they took and they put into the ground and they carved Ohara into the branch. So this burned out piece of wood and uh, that's like the grave memorial, that's like the marker for Ohara and then they throw the flowers on that, okay? Uh, those harmless scholars were completely wiped out just for questioning um, their authority, you know? Like, this is such a farce. Also, it goes on to say, Vegapunk says, like, you know, the, pro the propaganda that um, uh, the government spreads throughout the world is all about how the O'Harans were devils and they were trying to overthrow the government and that couldn't be further from the truth. Obviously, Vegapunk and Dragon don't buy into that at all. Um, Dragon states right there, he's like, I'm gonna raise an army that's gonna fight against them head on. Just watch Vegapunk. I'm going to change the world here. Um, you know, and uh, he says, this is, this is ominous. I can't wait until this is animated. Dragon's there just looking at that grave and he's like, the will of Ohara. 
will not die with Clover. Like, and I, I assume Dragon was also, like, you know, friends with Clover as well. You know what I mean? Same thing with Vegapunk, okay? And it also seems like Dragon and Vegapunk's relationship has become more amenable over the years as well because they were talking a few chapters ago, so they still stay in touch. So, at first, maybe Dragon was like, why would you join the world government, you know? But then after a while, it's just like, okay, he kind of understands what's all going on here, and Vegapunk still becomes an ally, okay? Uh, it's at this point that Shaka mentions that Ivankov, Dragon, and Kuma were all founding members of the world government there, so we're going to learn a little bit more about them in the future. We get the Straw Hats reactions to this, and each one of them have a different reaction. Uh, Nami's is just like, wow, Luffy's dad is really intense, and is like, yeah, that is true. Uh, because Elbaf was mentioned, Usopp is like, wait, did you say Elbaf? Go back to Elbaf. Robin's reaction is like, you know, Professor Clover's fate. Holy crap, that means the existence of the Revolutionary Army was directly due to what, what happened at Ohara. That is great. I mean, that's horrible, but that's great because that's basically the world government creating the Revolutionary Army. Because no, duh, you have an oppressive world government and a Tenryubito system that rules over the entire world and just like, yeah, we could just bust your call islands and do whatever we want. We're the world government. And then all of a sudden, because of that oppression, all that pressure, it coalesces into an opposing force, like a revolutionary army or something that goes against you, that's because of you guys. You know, if you wouldn't have Buster called O'Hara, if you wouldn't have acted like such dicks to the entire world, like the Tenrubito, then, um, you know, Dragon might not have created the Freedom Fighters. He might not have made the revolutionary army. So the Tenrubito, they made their bed with this. Now they got a lie in it, and it's filled with spikes and hot sauce and electric diodes. And I don't know what a diode is. I, I, I assume sitting on one would be painful. And, uh, I don't know, ravenous uh, wolverines, you know, and wolverine. Okay, so there you go. Uh, not fun, not fun. Uh, Frankie's reaction is like, you know, okay, well, why did Kuma help us? Why did you change him into a pacifista? So it's like all these questions at once, and Shaka's like, well, this is just conjecture. No, it's like, okay. But Shaka doesn't really answer any of those specific questions. He's like, it's, it's like in an RPG, where it's like this big story, and it's like you have a few dialogue options, like, ask about Dragon, ask about Elbath, ask about Clover, ask about Kuma. And it's like, you click each one of those, and they all result in the same thing, which is what Shaka, he doesn't respond to any of them. So, it is like, yeah. Uh, oh, what does Sanji say? Sanji says, um, oh, he just, because he knows Eva, because he trained on the Kamabaka Kingdom for two years, Sanji is just like, oh, Eva, wait a second. Wow, he was really a big shot? He really founded the Revolutionary Army? Wow, that's crazy. You know what I mean? So that's, that's all that Sanji brings up there, because he knows Eva. Um... Now, Shaka goes on to say, well, you know, it's been 20-something years. I knew where the books were. They got taken to Elbaf by the giants. So, I had time to kill, so I eventually went to Elbaf, and they had the entire collection of all of the books of Ohara on their island, and they were safeguarded by the giant covered in bandages, and they allowed Vegapunk to read every single one. And Shaka points to his head and he's like, it's all in my head right here. The Will of O'Hara, and I've continued all of their research. So, okay. We gotta back up here. We see a shot. by the way, okay, listen to me. Maybe some of you out there were like, eh, maybe the Straw Hats are going to go to Elbaf. Maybe a few of you were like, they're not going to go to Elbaf right now, or there's something else with Elbaf that's not going to happen. We're going to go to... No, 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 no. This chapter confirms it 137%. Okay, screw it. 138%. The Straw Hats are going to Elbaf now. Like, I think most people probably arrived at that conclusion. It's been set up for so damn long. They have to go to Elbaf now. This is the chapter that cements it, okay? Not just for the fact that all of the information they need is on that island, but also, Saul is still alive because we see him. When they mentioned the giant covered in bandages, I immediately thought of Saul. I'm sure everybody did, but it was just conjecture. But we see this one panel where, no, we see Vegapunk meeting with a giant in the library of O'Hara at Elbath. And uh, sure enough, sure enough, it's Saul. Saul's body, Saul's hair, and Saul's cowboy hat. He's just covered in bandages, okay? And um, Robin pretty much, he, she even confirms it. Uh, Robin even says, like, the, the giant covered in bandages? His name's Saul, isn't it? And I love this scene. Oh my god, that's so good. 
<laughs> um, and then Vegapunk doesn't, he just like, he's in hiding right now. I, I really don't have much more to tell you, but he's he's in hiding on Elbath. And so she just begins to weep and is just like, oh my God. Now let's talk about Saul surviving because maybe some of you might be like, oh my God, is this another pound to situation again? God, no one dies in this story. No, listen, seriously though, think about the, what happened with Saul. His death actually wasn't really all that confirmed, okay? So what happened with him was he was frozen by Aokiji and then left on the island when the Buster Call happened, okay? That's all we know about that situation, okay? So if you think about it, though, number one, simply being frozen by Aokiji, that's not necessarily going to kill you. It happened with Robin. It happened with Luffy. It happened with um, uh, Doflamingo, even, okay? And in the case with Doflamingo, you know, Aokiji flash froze him in like less than a second and then Doflamingo just broke out and he was kind of like, whew, okay, wow. You know, he was a little bit out of breath, but whatever. If Doflamingo could break out of the ice like that with like no negative side effects, maybe he was a little bit labored breathing afterwards. Um, Saul being a giant, you know what I mean? Like he has a little bit more of his con stat would be really through the roof, okay? So simply being frozen by Aokiji, I don't think is like an immediate death sentence, all right? Um, and also, you would imagine if he was frozen and then the island got set on fire, maybe that's how he broke free. So he gets frozen and then the island goes up and then maybe an explosion happens close to him and he's probably really scarred. He probably definitely has a lot of burns and scars. His whole body is covered in freaking uh, bandages. Half of his body probably got like his skin got peeled off from the ice. The other half got burned from the explosion. But he's a damn giant. Also, he's a vice admiral or he was a vice admiral, meaning he knows hockey. All vice admirals know hockey. So if he's a giant that knows armament hockey like some ice and some fire they might hurt him but the fact that he survived that's not completely ridiculous also he did not have a devil fruit so him escaping ohara is also not that ridiculous um you know just even if he was able to just get out you know he just like he's burned he's frozen he peels off his skin of his feet and he's just like ah oh and he like dives into the water and just tries to swim and maybe he loses consciousness and washes ashore on an island somewhere and he's like oh, oh gosh darn it and tarnation that was crazy you know like he's probably really banged up but he managed to make it out I I do find that pl plausible okay more so than if you were to say like Odin survived or Clover pops back up again you know what I mean he's a giant his constitution's a little bit better than other people and yeah I, I could see him surviving there it's not like they sliced off his head or something like that um, now, uh, oh, there was another point I wanted to bring up. Oh, okay. So, Saul and his relation to Elbath, that's another thing. Remember, Saul brought up to Robin that he was not from Elbath, okay? That's like the, the uh, traditional homeland of the giants, but not all giants are born in Elbath. He mentions there's other giants, you know, colonies and towns and places in the world, and obviously, the, you, you'd understand the Elbath is probably not even allied with the world government, and yet there are still giants that work for the Marines. So, you know, there's giants that are born in other parts of the world. And he mentions, like, oh yeah, the giants of Elbath, they're... They're a warfaring race, and I'm not really, you know, I don't really have the same kind of, like, ideals and stuff that they do. Like, I don't worship the same kind of war gods and stuff that they do and all that stuff. I don't go around and pillage, you know, I'm a member of the Marines, right? But, you know, at that point there, maybe Saul was like, the only people that could help me are the giants of Elbath. So maybe he made it to Elbath and he arrived there, and the Elbaf giants might not, well, they would probably know about Saul because he was a vice admiral, because he has some status, okay? So they might know about him, but he was not born there, okay? So he arrives, and he's a giant, and they patch him back up or whatever, and he explains to them the whole story. He's just like, I was a vice admiral in the Marines, and uh, then all of a sudden they just burned down O'Hara. All the scholars died, all the research, all the knowledge just destroyed, and maybe the giants were like, you know, what do you want us to do? Can you, can we help you at all right and it's just like because maybe they will stand against the world government as well and then they're just like I, the books we need to see if they can salvage any of the books and then the giants were like okay and they went to O'Hara and they salvaged the books and now Saul is hiding there to this day okay so Saul was oh I can't remember how old he was I'll put it down here because I don't remember um, but giants live a lot longer Saul was not like 300 years old or something like that he was probably over a hundred he would be 20 years older now but he would be fine you know what I mean and he's still you know bad badly injured and stuff, but I'm sure he's scarred, but he'll be okay. Um, 
So yeah, this is the equivalent of like Brooke finding out that Yorkie is still alive. You know what I mean? Like, Robin begins to weep tears of joy because the only friends that she's ever had in her life were literally Clover and then Saul for like two days and then nobody until the Straw Hats. So she had two friends growing up and then nothing, and then the Straw Hats, okay? So, there's a scene where Vegapunk says, like, you know, he's in hiding, I don't know anything more, I'm sorry, I can't confirm anything, and Robin's just like, mm. you know, she's just so happy. Oh my god. Thank you, Dr. Vegapunk. Thank you for not letting Ohara's sacrifice be in vain. So, but Vegapunk has access to all the information, all the knowledge, all the books that were saved, Clover's research notes probably, all of that stuff is in his head in the inner lab. And I guess they're gonna be heading there right now. Or maybe not in the inner lab because he said it's all in my head. Maybe he thought, I can't, I can't copy it down because maybe the government will find out, so I'll just keep it in my head, which, you know, he kind of opened up more information space because of the six satellite bodies and all that kind of stuff, okay? Moving on, at this point, the Dom shoes, I also wanted to throw out like I think if Robin couldn't like if she could actually move I think she would run over to like hug Vegapunk at this point you know like all the stuff but she literally cannot move so the Dom shoes literally like beep beep and then they just whoa they move along the floor like ah! you know like you can't control it and they move like a conveyor belt into the inner lab and Vegapunk's like sorry I can't shock is like I can't uh, release you yet however I do want to show you something so come into the inner lab with me and they all get like conveyor belted into the lab okay so that's the last scene with that now we cut back over to the last scene of the chapter into the junk heap where the giant robot was. And so Luffy and Chopper are trying to get inside of it and they can't find an opening. And so they're like, oh man, I guess we can't get in. Oh, it must be one of those uh, robots that like pilots itself, okay? So then they start trying to give like command moves, like move, transform, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And so they're yelling at this robot and uh, Bonnie's there and she's just like, guys, this robot is clearly like a piece of scrap metal. There's no way that it would be able to, you know, do anything, right? And at that point, you hear a very, like, well, actually, okay. There's this giant, like, ripple effect, like, boom! Like, like, energy beam just erupts from the damn robot. Like, all of a sudden, just boom! Like, energy waves hit the straw. It's like shock waves. It knocks them back or whatever. And then we see Dr. Vegapunk stuck in the robot. Like, half of his body is in the robot, and it's the main Stella body, and he's older now, but he's like, ah! Help me, please, Quasar! I'm stuck in this damn robot! And so Luffy's like, wait, is this a thing like with Kinemon? Or is it like, whatever? So they go over and they begin to like pull him out and he pops out of the robot and he begins to float around using his boots. And he's like, well, thank you, Quasar! I really appreciate that! Vegapunk's just thrown out like like, like Quasar, which by the way is like one of the favorite words to say when you're talking about astrophysics. Quasar! I don't even know what a Quasar is, but it sounds cool. It has a Q in it. Okay, so he's the, that's how he like ends his sentences. You know how like a lot of, you know, One Piece characters have weird like verbal quirks? This is his. Okay, so he starts floating around though and he's like, you know, Luffy and Chopper are like, whoa, you can fly? And just like, they're completely like, we just found a man fused into a robot, whatever. He's like, you can fly too? And Vegapunk's like, well, of course I can, Quasar! Check out these boots right here. You can do it too. Just pull that lever. And they're like, okay. So they pull the lever and it activates the hover function of the Dom shoes. And then they float up. And then the last scene of the chapter is uh, Vegapunk floating around with Luffy and Chopper and everybody. And he's like, Gad Zooks, looks like we've flown too far here. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what this voice is. I'm like combining like one part Southern Texan with like, I don't even know. I don't know what this voice is, but I like it. I'm going to keep doing this. Okay. So we see Dr. Vegapunk in the current storyline, the uh, leader of the Navy's SSG special science group, the man with the biggest brain in the whole world. Save us, Quasar! My goodness! You know? <laughs> okay. So, um... Uh, Vegapunk now looks a little different than he did in the past. His entire forehead, his entire head is now, like, gone, okay? So it looks like a normal head, basically. So basically, what it's implied that he did 
Now this is One Piece, so whatever. His brain increases in size considering how much knowledge he has, okay? So at some point, he got so much knowledge that he couldn't contain it anymore, so he broke him himself up into six of the bodies, and so literally it looks like it looks like he just took, like, a hacksaw and just, you know, or, like, a buzzsaw or something and just, and just cut off his brain and then, like, just redistributed it to six other bodies because it's just a flat top head with the top of an apple sticking out, okay? He's still got his tongue and everything. He's just older now with the same mustache. It's just his hair is white now. He's wearing a lab coat, and he's wearing a spotted, uh, spotted shirt, okay? By the way, um, this image of Vegapunk right here, the the really tall, lanky dude with the striped sweater. I, uh, I don't think that's gonna be revealed. I think that was more of just like, Oda didn't know the design back then, so. The best time to wear a striped sweater is none of the time. So that's really sad. But anyway, we see Vegapunk finally. Uh, he's obviously based off of Albert Einstein, uh, German physicist, d science, uh, E equals MC squared, um, Nuclear physics, time and space bending. Th that's all I got. I'm sorry. I didn't go to. I don't. I don't have a physics major. I'm sorry. Okay. But you know, he's he's Albert Einstein. We all know Albert Einstein, right? He's the e equals M C squared guy. I mean, come on, right? And so he's based off of that. And so because he cut off part of his head, he felt like he had to have something else there, I guess. So now the top of like an apple is on his head. So his head looks like an apple. So. I don't know what the um, the symbolism of the apple. I mean, Isaac Newton is the first thing I you know jump to with Isaac Newton under the tree, and then the apple fell, and he's like gravity. You know what I mean? I'm assuming that might be the reference. It, it probably has to be. So the crazy thing is though, what was the whole thing with the shock wave? I think Vegapunk tried to teleport to Luffy's location because he's like, you're the son of Dragon. I knew you'd come someday. I can't wait to talk to you. And then Bonnie's there and Bonnie's just like, Vegapunk! You know, and Vegapunk's like, oh, Bonnie, look at you. You've grown so much since the last time I've seen you. Quasar! You know, and so Vegapunk, I will kill you! It's like, now what is this now? What did I do? And so he wants to talk to Luffy, definitely. Bonnie's there out for revenge, so we'll see where that goes. I I think that Vegapunk found out where Luffy was. Like, oh, Luffy's in the junkyard right now. I'll just use the new Vegapunk teleportation thingamajig to transport, transport over to him. And he did, but he teleported into the robot so it wasn't quite, like, accurate. He was, like, phasing inside of solid matter, and then they had to pull him out, you know? So, kind of like, yeah. So, I guess that's what happened. I don't know. I'm just assuming. All right, well, um, that was a chapter. That was a lot of dialogue and lore but that was important for the story. We needed to have that. Is there a break next week? Um, no, there isn't. So, wow, we're just going to keep this train rolling. All right, here we go. Um, I, I, what does Vegapunk want to show everybody in his lab? Uh, what's Dr. Vegapunk's Stella body going to talk about with Luffy? Is he going to talk about Dragon a little bit? Are we going to find out more about the Revolutionary Army here? Uh, about the information of O'Hara? Uh, did Clover have his notes in those books? Are we going to find out the name of the Ancient Kingdom in the next chapter? Um... You know, what kind of tea are uh, Zoro and Brooke having on the Thousand Sunny right now? Is it chamomile? Is it Earl Grey? Is it iced tea? If it is iced tea, is it lemon? Is it lime? Is it raspberry? Is it peach? Is it sweet tea? So many questions we don't know yet. I guess we'll find out. But anyway, um, I feel like this has been going on for a long time, so I'm just going to end it here. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody, and Teching signing out. Quasar!